<laughs> hey everybody okay so I'm a little early I know um and I was gonna sit down and start weaving and talking but I'm I'm winding a stick shuttle and it's from the skein skein I don't know if you can see see right there yeah and it's kind of a tangled mess <laughs> so I'm going to there we go. All right, so I'm going to talk for a minute before while I get this ready. So anyway, hi, I'm Stacy Budge Camison with Urban Gypsy, and today I'm going to be weaving on my little loom, um, primarily because I've got a Christmas present deadline. <laughs> I'm going to make some little uh, woven pouches, zippered pouches, um, to house instead of wrapping using like gift wrap or gift bags to for some uh, little small gifts for my family. Anyway, so that's what's going on today. And I hope you guys had a great Thanksgiving. What I wanted to talk to you about today too, um, while I was weaving, but it's gonna be while I'm winding this for right now, is I went and saw this awesome fiber art show in uh, Philadelphia. So if you guys are anywhere near Philadelphia, um, it's at the it's at the Philadelphia Museum downtown, and and uh, but it's in the Perlman Building, which is across the street. Oh, let me, whoop, there, sorry, you see my big old finger. It's not doing that. Okay, anyway, so it's at the museum, and it's called off the wall and it's a lot of uh wearable fiber art and they have and i put pictures i took so many pictures of the pieces it was kind of a small show it was only three rooms so it wasn't overwhelming to go see and i put pictures on um if you look on my instagram i did an instagram stories but saved it to my highlights so it's called inspiration and there's some images from there there's also i put um, pictures on my Urban Gyp, was it on my Urban Gypsy? It might have been, it, you know, if it's not on Urban Gypsy, then it's on, uh, it's on my personal page. But you know what, I'll make sure to put it to Urban Gypsy. Anyway, the, the pieces were just insane. They were so beautiful. Um, there were, the first room, there was a lot of, of freeform crochet. Now, most of the pieces that were in this exhibit most of the pieces that were in this exhibit were from, oh, it's getting so tangled. Hold on. Okay, we're from the 60s and 70s and maybe a little bit of the 80s. Um, and, and it was all about freeform expression and breaking the rules as far as as uh breaking the rules as far as any of the uh, uh any traditional weaving or crocheting or dyeing goes and there was all kinds of mediums there was silk painting a lot of jackets uh there was some machine knitting there was some regular uh some freeform crochet and a little bit of leather, a little bit of, it was just uh, some quilting. Uh, it was it was just an amazing show. Anyway, it's really inspirational. Came home just inspired. So then yesterday um, was the art opening for the Reclaiming Her Time show, and I'll put a link to to that exhibit in the show notes. That's in the Research Triangle, and it's going to be up for another. They said another week, but it might be up for another two weeks. The all very bright light reflection in the background. Wait, hold on, let me see. Very bright light are reflected behind you. Yeah, it's the that. <laughs> yeah, that's my light. Um, but it will. That's going to be necessary when I sit down at the loom. So I'm just going to stand in front of it for now. Anyway, so what happened is the. Uh, the show, uh, it might go through, uh, it was supposed to close next week, but it might extend through the following week. 
and it is a, I have a piece in that show and it's all female artists. There's a couple of pieces of fiber art, but mostly it's painting. Um, there's a couple of 3D pieces and that show was really neat. But anyway, so yesterday was the open reception and I got to meet the other artists. And it was really interesting because all those other artists, um, all those other artists were very different. I mean, I mean, everybody, each one was so very different from, from the other. And, but yet we all were making art that had, that kind of presented some kind of statement. So it was really interesting to see, you know, different artists have different aesthetics, different backgrounds, different personalities, and, but yet we all came together in this show and it was a very cohesive show, but it was so interesting to meet the artists behind the pieces because we were all so very different. So I don't know who needs to hear that, but it, for me it was inspiring because sometimes, I know sometimes people, and I get this way, where I feel like as an artist or a fiber artist, I should be, you know, more avant-garde and more whatever. And that's just not the case. I mean, everybody comes to to what they believe and, and your visual language is based on your own personal background and everybody's different. So where are you coming from? No, uh, hold on, let me see. Where are you coming from? I am in Raleigh, North Carolina area. I'm, I'm just outside of Raleigh and Cary. All right, so I'm gonna switch the camera and I'm gonna show you what I'm working on. All right, let's see if I can get it in a, an angle that's, <laughs> that's gonna be okay. Uh, I might be turning it like this, how about that? Let me show lower it a little bit okay so i'm working on just a little loom and i've got this other piece this was a lot of my demo stuff and i just started another little piece and i'm just going to do a small square and i'm going to do it primarily in this yarn here let me show you this this is a hand spun single that's a little on the thin side and i spent it with weaving in mind and I might add some other colors, but for the most part, this is going to be um, a panel for for a zippered pouch, just a little square zippered pouch. And I've got, and I'll I'll put a link to a little blog post that has a pictorial tutorial on how I do that little zippered pouch with little woven pieces. It's basically a pattern I found on Pinterest. But it, well, it wasn't even a pattern. It was a tutorial on Pinterest that showed you how to um, make a lined zippered pouch. And so instead of using two different types of regular fabric, I used two different types of two pieces of weaving fabric for the outside part. All right, I'm going to check. I'm checking the comments. Hi from Wales. Hey from Wales. Oh, very bright light reflection behind me. Coming from Wales. Autocorrect is <laughs> all right. Yeah, autocorrect is a pain. Okay, so I'm just I'm just doing some basic weaving, and you know what's really interesting too is I that that show, like I said, was so inspiring. And what I'm gonna do is I need to sit down with my art journal and journal some of the inspirations I mean not just I mean I took pictures of the whole show but you know when I do my art journal those inspirations turn into turn into uh, a little more with a, a little more emotion and just you know reflection behind them because I mean it's one thing to take pictures and post it but when you when I art journal inspirations from stuff like this it turns into you know more of the impressions and more of the the raw feedback of of what i know or what what hit me when i saw that the pieces so it was a really really interesting interesting thing i love going to the philadelphia museum i don't think i've seen an exhibit a bad exhibit at the museum that's just a, a few 
cute. I saw Frida Kahlo there a few years ago. Actually, maybe it's more like 10 years ago. It was right, I think it was my first trip to Philadelphia that was at the museum. And we've got an exhibit of Frida Kahlo here in North Carolina, but it's not the same as the one that came through Philadelphia. The one in North Carolina is more of a photo archive of, of she and Diego and their relationship, whereas the exhibit that I saw in, in Philadelphia was a lot of her paintings. So, I mean, they had a few of the paintings in the other one, but in the North Carolina one. And that show's still going on through January. Now the show, the, the wearable show, the off the wall show, oh, let me turn this down. The off the wall show in Philadelphia, that's going through May. So there's, if you guys, any of you guys find yourself in the general area uh, before mid-May, go see that show. It is just amazing. And I tell you, some of that, uh, especially the freeform crochet is so, I mean, so similar to a lot of the freeform crochet that I see happening now. I mean, there was a, a distinct, I mean, the, now granted the, the, um, the yarns were different. I mean, you know, yarns from the seventies and yarns from today are very, very different in colors and textures and just in general, but a lot of the techniques, it was, it was just very interesting. So anyway, I'll put a link to um, my Instagram and you can check it out. It's in the, like I said, the highlights, there's some images from that. And I also found the dyeing stuff really, really cool because I've been working with the Shibori study group at the Weaver's Guild and did a little Shibori over the summer um, with an indigo vat. So, so that was fun. All right, you can see, you know, I love this because this is just one yarn and look how much texture that's popping out here. I don't know if you guys can see. Let me see if I can look at that. There we go. Yeah, there's a lot of texture popping out on that. Okay, where am I at? Check in the comments. I'm glad to catch you live. Stacy, you've been... Oh, yay. Glad you could join us, L.I. I'm not sure who, what your name is. February 4th was there in 2020. Okay. All right. Yeah, maybe I'll... But you know what? Maybe I will add a stripe of something contrasty right there. But I'm, I don't... Well, do I want to break the yarn? I'm going to break the yarn, but I'm going to break it... I mean, this is kind of thick, so I want to be at a thin spot when I wrap it around the edge. All right, that's a good spot to break it. Mm, scissors. And I'm just going to tuck it around that end and lay it back across this this shed here. I'm going to keep this nearby because I'm going to start back up with that. Alright. Let me do... I'm actually going to do this. This kind of peachy color. I think that'll look really cool against that brown. I'll find my... Where's my... Okay, here it is. I'm use this thin one because this is this is a little more the Sayori boat shuttle is a little thinner. Go. 
Okay, so since I ended that one over here, I'm going to start this one on this side so I can double this yarn over here and tuck it back into place right there. And I'm just going to do a few rows of this bright color for a stripe. Stacy, nice. is that cotton lace on the edges at the top and bottom? This actually is a single ply merino wool. And it's kind of... I used to sell this stuff. It, it's... I used to get it from um, Uruguay. So it's related to what you see Malabrigo, but it's just a little single ply um, wool lace. But cotton, cotton definitely would work at the edges here. Just check in the comments. All right. Yeah, as far as the edge, the edge stitch, because I did um, a hem stitch here. And I'll put a link to the video where I show you how I do the hem stitch if you haven't seen it already. But um, I find the hem stitch works best when I use a kind of thinnish yarn. So anything that's kind of fingering or sock yarn weight or thinner. And, and cotton, cotton's actually a really good, cotton weaving yarn is a great thing to, to start or end with. And I try to make sure it's not terribly textural or fancy or anything like that. Just a very, very basic, a lace yarn works wonderful. Um, but yeah, any cotton weaving yarn, anything that's not terribly, terribly thick. I mean, I guess you could do it with like an Aran weight, but I think then it gets a little bulky where you're stitching it into the ends there. All right, so I want to make the stripe thick enough to where it's not going to look like another little piece of yarn, I think. <laughs> I could change my mind. I don't know. I might like it to be looking thin like a little piece of yarn. So we'll see. Actually, that might not be a bad idea to do a couple of rows of different colors. Let me do that. Let's see what other colors I have already on the spindle, on the spindles, because I don't feel like uh, pausing to go over there and wind something else. All right, I've got, oh look, I've got this wonderful blue, and what else do I have? Maybe I'll just do the blue. You know, I wish I had a bright green. Here we go. I've got a bright green, but it's not, it's kind of worse. So what I might do is I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, and then I'm going to go to this blue and then start back up. And again, I'm not doing, but just a small amount. So right, let me leave this this and you know what I'm not sure if I'll make the back panel the same I might just do the back panel all in in this textural yarn okay. I'll lay that across there and this actually uses this big fat boat shuttle. I don't think I want to do that. Okay, so I'm just going to run this spindle through there, but you know what? I'm going to advance the warp a little bit to give my, to make it to where my shed opens up just a little bit more. Okay. was up so I'm gonna go down for the next one and I'm just gonna do a few rows of this I'm gonna start on this end since I started this on ended on that side so I want to start it on this side again this usually goes in my my big bolt shuttle oh well, I don't know but it's not too bad but yeah it's kind of it's a little tall to be going in and out of that. So I'm just gonna 
use it straight off the spindle. And again, it's, this is for a little zippered pouch, and I'm going to put the the link to the blog post. It's a Wordless Wednesday blog post from a few years ago where I made a zippered pouch with some some small weaving. Um, just like some little test weaving, actually, almost, that I had. All right, I think I'm just going to limit it to three rows to keep it kind of small, since it's also a very bright color. crafting and supplies and workshops you have. Oh goodness, now wait, where did you say you were from? Uh, Barefoot Spinner. From Wales, okay, got it. Yeah, you'd think that, because Wales, I, I imagine Wales would have a really large knitting community, but it might be, I had a friend who went to Germany and was thinking she would be able to go to all these yarn stores, and she just said she, was not finding them, so I don't know where, I guess, I don't know, do people spin their yarn? Oh wait, I want to put this in the, in my boat shuttle, I don't need to do it this way. And imagine shipping is a nightmare with trying to ship from the U.S. to overseas I know it was kind of pricey when I was had a yarn business and was shipping things uh, but that was before they added all these new tariffs over the last couple of years so I can imagine it's probably through the roof all right, let's see. yeah I haven't even I, you know I had some suppliers that were out of the country too and I haven't ordered anything since since the since we had these new trade wars so I don't I have no idea but I imagine it's way more expensive than it used to be okay Like that okay so I'm just gonna keep it just kind of kind of small because I just want a little tiny pop of color nothing nothing that's gonna stand out too much although I love this blue I think this blue is one of my favorite colors I say favorite colors but you know I, that changes every time I see a new one I love okay just I started on this end but this yarn where I folded it over here is a little on the thick side so I think I might end it on this side just to even it up a little bit. I'm going to do two more rows I think. Okay, so it's just a little short area, but I think it's going to be good. I'm going to get this out of the way, and I'm going to start back up with this yarn. And I'm going to start it, again, I'm going to start it on this end, because I think this is adding so much bulk over here that I think it's going to be okay if I add it on this end. And this time I'm, you know, I'm usually adverse to, to be, making anything super stripey, but I like this intentional stripe. And I think too, you're because of the nature of this this yarn. 
I mean, it's so wild. There's the, the even just the big section of, of the art yarn has enough color to break up any, any feeling of stripe within that main part. So fun. Yeah, right? I love Sayori too. I wish, I wish I had a Sayori loom. I tell you, even, um, even just like a simple piccolo. Now I had a chance at a Sayori studio to, to try, um, like the big four shaft 36 inch loom and that was pretty yummy but I tell you as far as a four shaft loom I kind of would rather a more traditional floor loom but I loved 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 weaving on the piccolo which kind of surprised me but I guess in the same way that I like weaving on this small loom um weaving on the piccolo was just wonderful it was a, a wonderful little size it was, there was, I mean, it was just, you know, simple two petals, but when you're doing that Sayori weaving, I mean, really, you don't need the four shafts. I mean, there's so much going on. There's so much you can do with just two shafts or even no shaft, even just a rigid head of loom, but, but yeah, I really, I really, really, really love that little piccolo loom one day that's that's going to be that's a goal one day i will have a piccolo loom all right oh uh oh uh, a little weakness in the yarn so i'm going to have to do a little overlap and this is here it's going i'm going to show you how you okay so what happened is this yarn this yarn this yarn contains a lot of thrums, and it was car I carded a bat, and I had taken my little bits of yarn that I saved from, you know, warp ends or um, or knitting projects and stuff, and I carded a big bat, and then I put those ends in. Well, here, where those some of those yarn ends were spun in there was a weak spot in the wool part and so it broke so what I'm gonna do is rather than I'm gonna show you how I just deal with something like that and for this kind of weaving what I'm gonna do okay so you see where this is gonna end kind of in the middle of that row so rather than I'm just gonna take this and just lay it, overlap that across the top there. All right, and it might be a little bulkier right there, but since it's this kind of freeform weaving, I think that's gonna be just fine. So yeah, so yeah, so this kind of art weaving, like I said, I carded a bat and I just used a lot of remnant fiber and, and remnant yarn like I can see right here. I don't know if you guys can see that. Right here. That's like a little bit of ribbon right there. So that's I mean just lots of just remnant fiber that I cut into bits. And I sandwiched between pe um, layers of wool. And oh, we're getting almost to a square. And made this crazy bat. And then just spun a relatively thin-ish. There's some thick and thin areas. But spun it thinner than I would spin for knitting. Um, because I like the contrast between, you know, a kind of thinner yarn and then the textures that pop out from the, the remnant fiber. So I spun this with weaving in mind. Right. And I'm wondering, you know, this might be, I don't know if it is, it might not be. I don't think this is one of the bats that I carded in that example from a couple years ago, but I'll put a link to that video 
because it's very similar. If it's not this exact bat for this yarn, it, I did some very similar things showing you how I layer some of the fibers. All right. Let's see. I'm gonna do just a few more rows. I might need to advance it for a minute though. All right, I'm gonna check and see. a class weft different from sayway a uh, class weft actually is is a uh is a technique uh sayori let's see if i have an example of class weft handy and i don't think i do class weft is um is a way of of weaving two different types of two colors or two textures contrasting colors or textures in a way that that um, that puts the colors on each side, and it's a technique that's used within sayori weaving. Sayori weaving is is kind of like it's like a free form weaving, but it's specific to a sayori loom. Is and there's there's some other you know philosophies that's behind you know the sayori trademark, and I'll put a link to to another video that I did very recently where I talked about the difference between sayori and freeform weaving. Um, and it explains it a little bit better. But there's, I mean, there's a lot of, a lot of philosophy behind the sayori weaving as far as, and, and I don't know enough about it to really talk very uh, succinctly about it. But I know a lot of it has to do with being and with the inspirations of the moment and dropping into your heart and just, I don't know, just, uh, just kind of, of letting, letting the, the materials and just your intuition guide you. And it's similar with, with freeform weaving, but again, and it's probably very, very close to the same thing, but the, the biggest difference being that Sayori weaving um, is traditionally done on the Sayori loom, and there are certified Sayori teachers. So to teach Sayori, you know, from what I understand, you need to become a certified teacher to be able to use that name. So, all right, so I'm getting close to the square here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to break this here. Um, where was I? Down. Okay. And I'm going to loop it over that end yarn and tuck that back into here. All right, so I'm going to pick up that same color of dusty mauve yarn. Okay, so this dusty mauve yarn. I'm going to do that little end piece. Okay. Well, I agree. Japanese aesthetics are rooted in philosophy. Okay. Yay. Is Sayori a new concept of ancient? That's a good question. I know that the woman who... The woman who... Who is like the... The, I guess invented it. I mean, she just recently died. So, and she died at the age, like she was over a hundred years old. So I don't know that it's necessarily rooted in anything super ancient. Um, I know that uh, the looms themselves, the looms themselves, um, lend themselves to to. There's a lot of innovation in the looms that make it easier to sit down and weave. And that being that you don't spend as much time warping the loom, which is a big plus because I tell you, sometimes, I mean, these little looms are easy to, to warp quickly, but sometimes like a floor loom, it can take me two to three days to warp that depending on how tangled my warp gets. But, um, 
but a lot of the the tech the it, it feels like the 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 techniques are rooted in Japanese philosophy of like wabi sabi and 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 embracing mistakes as design elements, you know, and just kind of being mindful of of things that happen. Like if you like if you're warping a loom and and you accidentally get two threads within your heddle and and you know slate in the same heddle and read. I mean, rather than trying to cut it out, just just embrace it as a design element and work with it in in your design as a, a gift of uniqueness. So and I know that's that's kind of what Wabi Sabi's about. They also have this, and I don't know the name of it, but I know one of you guys probably know what it's called, where Japanese pottery when there's a crack or a break in the pottery that they fill it with gold and it's a, a moment and it's, it's like a, it's not a de considered a defect, but considered greater in value because it has that, a chance to add a, a bit of, of uniqueness to a piece of work, a little bit of imperfection. And I can't think of what it's called. So, I mean, I see that, that kind of philosophy where it's kind of in the same vein of, of working, you know, and I, I guess, you know, the same thing with freeform. I mean, you know, as, as I look at this piece, you know, this, this yarn where I doubled it over at the end, you know, makes it, makes it not a perfect line, but I think I'm okay with that because also there's so much imperfection when it comes to the textures here, you know, I might even play with the texture once I get it sewn up, like there's a piece of ribbon right here that I might pull out, you know, and let that be a highlight. All right, so let me do a couple more rows and then I'm gonna leave the end for hem stitching. And again, I'll put a link to where I have a demonstration of how to hem stitch, but I'm not gonna hem stitch here, I'm gonna do that off camera. All right, let me check questions again. Thank you for the Thank you. I wish people were more like that with themselves and each other. Yeah, I agree. Oh my goodness, right? I think, uh, well, especially too, I find that there's, there's, especially with weaving and spinning, um, and even knitting, even knitting, I think that there's a lot of, um, traditional fiber workers who, who really super embrace the traditions. And I, I get it. I know that, um, there's a lot to be said for, for traditions. Um, I'm going to do one more thing and I'm going to switch the camera around. And talk about this for a minute because there's this really neat thing that might be happening okay so yeah i, I kind of wish that they would embrace that as well because i think people get so hooked into the traditions and the patterns but yet if you look at like take knitting for instance if you look at um ancient inf you know old information about knitting that they didn't often use patterns i mean when you get back to like history of knitting a lot of it is just prevalent i mean it's stuff that they knew okay so i'm gonna switch this camera around really quick there i am okay so let me show you this book if i can put my hands on it really quick uh i might not be able to put my hands on it really quick there's um mm, yeah, I wasn't prepared to talk about this. Um, there's a book called... Okay, here we go. Ugh. This is the book. Ethnic Knitting Discoveries. Okay, so this book is, um, is by Donna Dracanus. 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 Gosh, I'm sorry, Donna, if I'm slaying your name. Anyway, she wrote this book, and it's based on 
on another book that's one of my favorites that I probably can't put my hands on again either <laughs> because it's probably sitting somewhere else. I'm looking really quick. If I don't see it right off the bat, then I'm going to talk without it. Okay, so this book is based on another book by Victoria something or other Gibson. And it talks about, in the, the book talks about the original one, um, I think it's called Knitting in the Old Way, uh, talks about how, and it's my favorite knitting book. So basically, knitting way back when, we're talking, you know, throughout throughout the world. I mean, they talk about, you know, Estonian knitting. They talk about knitting, you know, in Great Britain and knitting in, in you know, all kinds of places. Um, Fair Isle, all these different places, Iceland, that they all had different ways of constructing sweaters that were just kind of based off of general measurements and they didn't really go by patterns. Um, they had different stitches that they would use and they would piece it together and they would just kind of knit to fit type of thing. Um, and it's kind of the same, I feel like it's, it's almost like fiber art coming full circle because I know that there's a type of freeform knitting um, that people like Jane Thornley do, and I'm gonna put a link to her information, where she doesn't use a pattern, but she, you're, you're knitting with inspiration and you're knitting to fit and you're fitting the piece to your body as you work. So, you know, but in between these two techniques, there's, there was an evolution of, of knitting that, that turned, you know, what was intuitive knitting into patterns. So, so Donna wrote this book and it's based on, off of that other book, and it kind of takes the same ideas of of taking just some basic patterns and and making some sweaters you know based on traditional methods so i think that's really really wonderful and she kind of makes it a little easier than that that um this book it makes it breaks it down and makes it a little easier to understand than the knitting in the old way because sometimes it took me a year to figure out exactly what that book was talking about but she makes it she kind of makes it a little easier with these techniques anyway but um so the same with kind of with weaving because i know that there's a lot of you know in making cloth that they would make yards of cloth and they would do it pretty fast and i know that there's a lot of weavers who who work traditionally and they weave cloth really fast and they have a set pattern, they have a set weft, they have a set warp, and they just can weave yards of cloth really fast. Well, this, this kind of weaving is a little more mindful and, and you're kind of being inspired in the moment and it feels more like, like, a, like a tapestry type of thing. Um, I feel like it's almost like my weaving becomes a ballad of my inspirations in the moment. So, and it depends, you know, on what yarns I picked up. It's kind of like this piece I just did here. All of a sudden, I was going to just do this, you know, weaving with this yarn. And then I thought, hmm, let me add a little pop of color because I was inspired to throw in a pop of color. You know, and it's just, you know, it doesn't have to be anything, any great thing. But, you know, colors, colors uh, and textures evoke different sensibilities when it comes to your cloth. So in that way, yeah, I mean, I, I kind of wish that other people were, were a little freer with their cloth, but I also understand the utility of making, you know, cloth for yardage. But I think when it comes to making art, I mean, especially when you're weaving, to be able to, to sit down and, and just manipulate the fibers and the manipulate the warp and the weft you know, and, and what, what does that kind of bring to the, to the picture? Like, okay, so this is that piece that I've been working on, right? You know, when it's hanging, you know, there's areas here where I distress the fabric. You know, there's areas here that hang down that you see the different textures and it's gonna present, you know, different, different characteristics for the cloth. So anyway, I don't know where I was going with that. But I agree. <laughs> yes, people should be more free with their work. And, and I think um, if they just trust their intuition, then that becomes their visual language, right? I mean, your intuition is part of you. It's what subconsciously, you know, all the inspirations that you gather when you're taking your walks, when you're, 
you know, uh, when you're uh, visiting with family or when you're in a museum. I mean, it might be that, that you know, so adding this texture to this cloth might remind me of bark. You know, it might remind me of the spaces between pine bark and stuff like that. Or, you know, this, this tangle of, of, of uh, fibers here might remind me of, of a bird's nest as a, a mama bird's co collecting different fibers and feathers and stuff, uh, weaving her nest for her babies. I mean, there's, there's all kinds of things. I mean, you know, that show from Philadelphia is going to stick with me. I mean, there's, there's something about that show, you know, that I can find that I'll be inspired by different things that I saw in that show. And, and how will I translate it into, into what I do? So we'll see. <laughs> it might be months from now. I don't know. And that's where art journaling comes in handy because you know, if I journal what I know in that moment, then flipping back through the journal, I, it might spark a memory as I begin to do work, or I might be able to take some of those ideas and sketch them out and flesh out some ideas for pieces. So anyway, I'm gonna be starting that art journaling membership sometime after the first of the year. Um, I'm working on the technical stuff of it, which is a steep slope, let me tell you. Um, but. But yeah, but in, in that class, we'll talk about harnessing your inspirations in the moment and then going back and, and how you can use those inspirations to flesh out ideas for your work. Anyway, so that's what's behind the art journaling class. All right, I'm going to check one more time to see if there's any other questions or comments. And then I'm going to be signing off. Okay, shibori. Shibori is an ancient form of... of it's like, it's the ancient Japanese version of tie-dye is basically what it is. It's, um, but they're real mindful about, um, well, I get tie-dyers are too. I mean, they can create these beautiful designs, but um, shibori to me can have those wonderful, big, busy designs, but it also can be very fine, fine, fine details. Um, and they use tying and binding and stitching and clamping and, and res, you know, clamp resists and stuff like that for um, as far as, uh, uh, for texture, for, for different patterns when they're dying with fabric. And it seems like, and I could be wrong, shibori, um, uses most of the traditional shibori that I see uses indigo and indigo as a dye, <clears throat> indigo is kind of like what they use on blue jeans or they used to use. I don't think they do anymore. Maybe they do. I don't know. Anyway, um, oh, shibui. <laughs> Oh gosh, I'm going off on this tangent on shibori. Anyway, but yeah, shibori, um, the indigo lays on the surface as opposed to necessarily penetrating the fiber. That's why uh, blue jeans tended to, to fade because the indigo, that kind of dye, sits on the surface as opposed to penetrate the fabric. Okay, shibui. I'm not sure if I know what shibui is. Is shibui the, the thing um, with the broken pottery? I don't know. That's a good question. Uh, Kitsugi, okay, got it. Repairing with gold, that's exactly it. Yes, thank you. Uh, Maybe Mary's called the spirit line. Yes, Ooh, that sounds wonderful. Learning a lot here, thanks. Oh, good, yay. <laughs> okay, our purpose for mindful and shibui. Okay, shibui. I'm not sure I, I know what shibui is. I should know what shibui is. I'll look it up. That's what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna look it up. <laughs> and I'll put it in the show notes. I'll look it up and I'll put it in the show notes. That's my homework. All right. So thanks for joining. Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure if I'm going to be live next week. I am going to be, I'm probably not going to be live. It's not going to be at three o'clock because I have a friend who's having a little thing. And so I'm going to be out of town at her thing. Um, but if I do go live, it'll be at a different time and I will post it in the newsletter on Wednesday. If you're not a member of my newsletter, I'm going to put a link in the description of this video and sign up and you'll get notices of, and links to these live casts. Otherwise, anyway, I'm Stacey Budge Camison with Urban Gypsy. If you like this video, please give me a thumbs up or leave me a comment. And if you're not already subscribed, then please subscribe to my channel. And I will talk to you. If it's not next week, it'll be the week after. Yay! Thanks for joining. Bye.